Behind this red door, in a small industrial area located in southern Stockholm, lies a bronze foundry. Hermann Behrmann started his foundry in 1895. It is the largest and oldest fine art foundry in Scandinavia. In 1954, after Hermann's death, the sons took over and kept it in the family until 1977 when some of the workers stepped up as owners. And again, around the millennium break, a new group of workers accepted the responsibility to keep the heritage alive. One of the reasons it has survived this long is due to the use of two casting techniques that complement one another. The first dates back to ancient times, known worldwide as Sirpedu, or lost wax casting. It is particularly well suited for casting detailed sculptures and art objects. The second is a project of the industrialization, known as pea sand mold casting, or simply sand casting. It has been used very successfully when casting large statues and monuments, as well as smaller but less intricate objects. The Sirpedu technique starts with creating a mold of the artist's original. The inner mold, which is an exact negative of the original model, is usually created by silicone. The soft silicone mold is then supported by a harder outer mold or casing. Often made from plaster, but can also be created by fiberglass and other materials. It is rarely practical for a sculpture to be molded in one piece. Therefore, it is usually a need to create several molds for just one sculpture, especially when casting larger and more complex art pieces. Once the mold is finished, molten wax is painted and cast into it. The wax is left to cool down until the desired thickness has set onto the mold. Then the rest of the wax is poured out again. The mold is turned upside down and the wax layer is left to cool and harden creating a hollow wax replica of the original sculpture. The hollow wax copy is then removed from the mold. It must now be chased or retouched to erase the small surface imperfections that comes from the molding. In fact, even if the mold is perfect, it creates unavoidable errors. Therefore, the quality of the wax chasing is crucial. This is often done together with the artist to reach perfection. Soft chasing wax will be used to fill voids and remove any defects. It's applied with special tools. Sometimes the sculptor even wants to change the look of the sculpture and the best time to do so is while it's still in wax. When the wax copy is chased, it is fitted with a sprue system also known as runners. In most cases done by wax rods or pipes. After they are melted out, this will become hollow channels through which the bronze will be poured into the molds. Designing the sprue system is a complex task that demands planning as well as experience and an understanding of fluidity. Listening to the foundry workers speak, you will hear words like funnel, vents and losers. These are some of the things used to control the flow and gases. First, the wax has to be able to escape the mold during the burnout. Then the sprue system has to control the flow of metal so that it fills the whole mold evenly. It also has to let all the heated air and gases out. Poorly designed, it can result in a ruined cast and weeks of work needed to be redone. After the sprue system is fitted to the wax, it is ready to be invested. First step is to defat the surface of the wax so that the water-based investment slurry sticks onto the wax. After this, the first layer of investment slurry is flicked onto the wax by hand a technique extremely hard to master. Next step is to put a mold around the wax copy and cast the second layer of ceramic slurry around it. Creating a solid mold ready for the burnout oven. The mold is then put into the oven and slowly heated. First the heat will make the wax melt and pour out, then still slowly heated until the ceramic molds are glowing bright white. This process is called sintering 
or frittage and fuses the mold to make it strong enough to handle the liquid bronze. The oven is let to slowly descend to an acceptable work temperature and when the molds are cold enough to be handled by the workers, the oven is unloaded. The molds is now strengthened even further by steel bands and sand to secure any micro cracks from opening during the pour. Before pouring the bronze, it has to be liquid. This is achieved by heating the bronze ingots to about 1100 degrees Celsius or about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Waiting for the bronze to melt, we take a tour through the pea sand mold casting technique. The sand casting techniques starts with planning the work. Can it be done whole? Since the sand casting techniques is a direct imprint technique, sometimes either the artist's original has to be cut or a cast copy has to be made. The mold is divided into two halves, the cope and the drag, which meet along the parting line. Both mold halves are contained inside a box, called a flask. The sand mount, usually done with oil or water-based sand, decides where the part line goes. The two master halves are important, since they control all the work going forward. Done poorly, the mold might need to be broken and redone from scratch again. Or at least, the work could become a lot harder. When the parting is decided and done, all the pieces of the first half, the cope, has to be created. They all have to be able to be removed. This is also the time to create the runners for the first side of the mold, usually done with clay. After the pieces of the cope is made, it is time for the sand pour or slinging. This creates an outer rim that fixes the pieces in place. When this is done, the mold is turned upside down and the sand mount is removed. All the pieces of the drag and its runners should now be made. Another sand pour for this half. Now the two halves are made, it is time for the core. The mold is opened and the pieces carefully removed so that the sculptor's original can be removed. When the original is removed, the pieces are put back. The bottom half, the drag, is now clad with a layer of clay. When removed later, this will be the hollow part of the drag, room for the bronze. A core iron is created to keep the core in its place. Another sand pour is now done to fill the void from the original and create the core. This pour is overfilled so that the excess will fill the top half, the cope, which is pressed down on top of the drag. The core is then manually cut down, leaving room inside of the cope for the bronze. The clay is removed and insides are painted with a heat shielding material. Then the halves are pressed together and turned vertical. Now it's time to pour the bronze. A classical pour, done by hand. Hot, heavy and potentially dangerous. The tension, focus and anticipation in the room is very apparent. This is the moment the team of the foundry workers have been working for, perhaps for weeks. First lost wax casting.
the sun and the moon and the stars and the sickness in me. Next, the sand casting no technique. Dreams, no love, just night without sleep. Yeah, night without sleep. Night without sleep. When the molds have become cold again, it is time to break them open. This is done literally by breaking them open, using axes, sledgehammers and other tools to remove the ceramic or the sand from the bronze. Carefully, of course, to not damage the surface of the bronze cast. When most of the ceramic or sand is removed, it is sandblasted. This cleans the bronze from ceramic residues and oxides that otherwise would shorten the lifespan of the chasing tools. Also, it would make it easier to see any defects that has occurred during the burnout or casting. After the sandblasting, the bronze chasing starts. This is where any surface defects from cast or burnout is chased away. This is done with special chasing hammers various chasing punches and grinding tools. This also includes welding the different parts together, as well as technical constructions like fountain pipes, steel reinforcements and anchor points. When the bronze chasing of the sculpture is complete and the artist is satisfied, the surface finishing begins. Most often done by patinating the sculpture. This means that the surface is treated using acids and metal salts to achieve an oxidation, thus giving color to the bronze. Sometimes the patina is enhanced by pigmentation, a process called colorization. This can be taken quite far but at some point it becomes extremely fragile. If more color than this is needed, it is advised to paint it instead. Other types of finishes are also possible, like gilding and plating.
And now, the sculpture is ready to be delivered.